Мартин Вулф, ведущий экономический Мартин Вулф, chief economics commentator the Financial Times. Recently, he was promoted to the commander of the British Empire for his merits in financial journalism. He has an academic degree from the London School of Economics. In Back in 2010 and 2011, he used to be a member of the British Commission of the Banking System. He is a leading and he's a most respective a respected economic commentator of our times. His Financial Times columns are, me are mandatory reading for bankers and investors, politicians and scholars, for everyone who is interested in finance. He is an author of several most influential companies, uh, books like Why Globalization Works and Fixing Finance. Today, he will present his most recent books, The Shifts and the Shocks, what we have learned and have still to learn from the financial crisis. This book was well received by many outstanding economists, although it is a dissenting vote in the economics uh, world. So you please feel free to purchase this book here downstairs in building one or in building four. Please put your switch your mobile phones to silent. And you have the floor, Martin. This off too. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you for the kind introduction. I must make one correction not to avoid embarrassing uh, the London School of Economics. I actually studied at Oxford. Um, and uh, uh, my graduate degree was also from Oxford. Um, and the LSE would probably think that that means I'm not really a professional economist at all. Um, so it's a great honor and pleasure to be here and to present uh, um, my book. Um, uh, it's about 20 years since I last visited uh, Moscow, uh, uh, so I've been fascinated by how much it has changed, at least physically. Um, uh, I had the great honor and pleasure of meeting Mr. Guider quite a few times here uh, when he was in government, um, particularly in the early, uh, very early years of reform. Um, uh, and I came to Moscow quite a few times, first time actually in 1990, when the FT did the first and last uh, survey of the Soviet Union. And the, um, I met Mr. Gaidar and was immensely impressed by his courage, uh, his intellectual clarity, and by the simple staggering difficulty of the task he was undertaking with his colleagues. Uh, I was very sorry about his early death. Um, I met him quite often subsequently in the West, and I'm therefore immensely pleased to be participating in this forum, um, um, uh, which uh, is named after him. Um, uh, secondly, I am surprised and honored that the, my book was translated into Russian. I think it's the first time a book of mine has been translated into Russian. Uh, the languages into which one's books get translated are strangely random. Uh, uh, so I have some translations into languages I would never have imagined uh, uh, for, for particular books of mine. Um, but I'd say I'm actually really quite interested and surprised, but also very, very pleased this book has been published in uh, in, uh, um, in Russian. The interesting point, and this is sort of a joke, is that there are two languages into which uh, my, none of my books has ever been published. And I thought I'd mention this because it might tell you something. And those two languages are French and German. Uh, uh, because, of course, from the French point of view, I'm an Anglo-Saxon liberal and therefore despicable. And from the German point of view, I'm a Keynesian and therefore despicable. And uh, so they don't want to read me. 
and they say, well, if there are strange French and German people who do want to read me, they can read it in English anyway, because the, those sorts of people understand English, and the ones who don't aren't interested. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, uh, the language into which every book of mine has been published, and I think it's very interesting, of major world languages, the only one, I think, into which uh, all my books have been published is Chinese, in both simple and complex versions. So that, I think, tells you a little bit about the, the, what's going on in the world intellectually. So let me tell you now briefly, and I really briefly, what this book is about. Uh, and it, please do not regard what I'm going to say as a substitute for reading the book, uh, the, which I think presents, at the very least, a, an exceptionally wide-ranging analysis of how the crisis came about. And, uh, uh, and even if you don't agree with my policy recommendations, uh, the analysis, I think, is more complete than in any other book I know of. And therefore, at least is a starting point in understanding what is unquestionably the biggest economic event of the last 15 years, I would say longer than that. And as is becoming increasingly obvious, a huge political event as well, because it has, uh, and I'll come to that at the end, transformed... Um, the relationship between the people at large and financial, economic, and political elites in the Western world, and therefore destabilized our politics. This was something I was concerned about. I discuss in the last chapter of my book at some length, but I must say it has, the extent to which this has happened uh, and the speed with which it's happened in the last year has surprised me. So I want to divide my remarks into essentially uh, uh, something happens. No, doesn't happen. I'm doing something wrong. Something, something, yes, yes. Ah, you can try. try okay. No, it yes. Um, so I'm going to divide my remarks, which will be about 20 minutes now, into three sections. Why the subject of the book matters. Um, then what happened uh, during the, the, uh, to bring, create the crisis and afterwards, bringing up to date some of this discussion in the book, which is now inevitably a little old, and then a little bit of a discussion of some of the policy implications of the crisis. So um, to start with why this matters, um, I think we have to accept that the scale of the financial crisis was essentially unexpected by uh, almost all professional economists uh, in the West, by more significantly all the major um, uh, institutions of domestic and global governance, by which I mean treasuries, central banks, the International Monetary Fund, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and so forth. Probably the only important exception to that was the Bank for International Settlements, where uh, a couple of economists, but particularly Bill White, had been taking a sort of neo vixellian line, uh, which emphasized the potential dangers of credit expansion, but the BIS was regarded as a wild outlier and was generally ignored before the crisis. Um, so it was an institutional failure, but I would argue that it was also, a, in a quite important way, an intellectual fa failure. Now this was not because economists didn't understand there could be market failures, a lot of work in financial, in economics, had been done by people like Joe Stiglitz on information problems and incentive problems. Um, but I think it was we fair to say that the dominant orthodoxy of financial economics and macroeconomics uh, 
basically had converged around two uh, propositions. One, it was necessary to stabilize inflation. Two, it was wise and appropriate, appropriate to deregulate the financial system to make markets more complete. And if you did these two things together, we would generate reasonably stable prosperity. And I think that was the, the dominant conventional wisdom. And it was not just of these institutions, but of most professional economists. As I said, you could always find in economics some opposition to that, but that was the dominant conventional wisdom. And in the event, this turned out quite clearly to be false, and not a little bit false, but totally false. In uh, 2007 and 8, we had a gigantic financial crisis, arguably the biggest financial crisis, um, not the biggest economic crisis, but the biggest financial crisis the world has ever seen in, in the autumn of 2008, essentially the core of the global financial system, the, globe, the relationship between the global banks broke down and had to be comprehensively rescued with um, uh, a commitment by all the major states to um, unlimited guarantees, essentially unlimited guarantees of the solvency and liquidity of their banks. And so that was not uh, some sort of minor event. Um, now, I think my view in the book is not that, that not that the mistake made was the failure to forecast this. An event of this kind is, I think, unforecastable for obvious reasons. If it could be forecast, people would have acted in such a way as to prevent it. I mean, forecasted with reasonable confidence and reliability. It couldn't be, certainly not the timing. But I think the bigger problem was, at least for the the dominant view that I've described is that such a gigantic crisis was seen as inconceivable. And that view was very famously expressed by Alan Greenspan in um, a testimony he gave before Congress in October of uh, 2008, in which he said, in essence, that his model of rational self-interest uh, in the financial sector had clearly proven false. Um, uh, I think economists didn't understand um, the, the nature of the dangers and risks because they didn't understand an idea, a very, to my mind, very powerful idea, which Hyman Minsky, very well-known heterodox economist, had put forward. Uh, he died in, I think, 1996. And his idea was, and I quote, stability destabilizes. That is to say, a long period of stability uh, encourages people to underestimate tail risks. And by underestimating tail risks, they make actions, they take actions which increase those risks. Uh, so uh, risk taking is endogenous to this, to this system and ultimately massively destabilizing. And so that's the first reason why the crisis matters. It's an intellectual challenge. And the second reason the crisis challenges, and this is an updated chart, is that it has been immensely costly. Now, I don't have the time to go through the many possible interpretations of this chart, but I think it's a very, very simple and powerful chart, which you can see up there on the screen. So, and I've updated it, but similar charts appear in the book. Essentially what the chart shows is that the red line shows um, the actual trend of GDP for the advanced economies as a whole uh, in real terms um, uh, as uh, computed by the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. And you can, and the green line is the simple uh, exponential trend line from 1979 to 2007 extrapolated forward. 
So it's extrapolated forward. And that was, I assure you, the dominant expectation of all the institutions I mentioned that GDP would continue on the green line, while in fact it's gone on the red line. And the blue line, which the scale of which you can read on the right side, shows the deviation of actual GDP from trend, <coughs> the pre-crisis trend, as a proportion of the pre-crisis trend. So as of 2016, roughly speaking, the aggregate GDP of the Western world, this is the entire advanced countries, so it includes Europe, Western Europe, North America and Japan, that's essentially the universe here, um, still uh, uh, about half the world economy at purchasing power parity. Um, the, the aggregate GDP is one-sixth smaller than it would have been if the pre-crisis trend had continued. And if this continues, it will be one-fifth smaller by 2020. So not only ha did we have a huge crisis, uh, as you can see, the huge recession in 2008-9, but subsequent growth rates have never got close to the pre-crisis growth rates. So it is absolutely clear that the financial crisis was a turning point in GDP performance and has had huge cumulative losses. In fact, it seems, so far as I can see, to be the costliest single event of this kind we know of um, except for the Great Depression itself, with, and with the qualification that the Great Depression, um, uh, that the losses in GDP in the Great Depression were fully recouped in the 50s. So fully recouped, uh, and more than fully recouped. So far, we see no sign of that. that. That One of the big questions is whether it will change in future. But the losses at the moment are very large. Um, uh, the, um, uh, um, sorry, let me just, I'm a bit puzzled by this. Um, so let me just go on. Um, so the second question is, what happened? Um, why did this happen? Um, the main theme of my book is that there were two interlocking, interconnected causal factors, macroeconomic and financial. And it is the interaction of these two things that is at the root of this enormous crisis. Um, the macroeconomic uh, trigger was a collapse in global real interest rates. Uh, there are many different charts which indicate this collapse. Um, uh, but they all show broadly the same thing, that from the early 90s, uh, um, early to mid 90s, there was an enormous fall in global real interest rates. This particular chart, which does appear in the book, um, brings this out in a particularly, I think, sharp way. Uh, it shows that uh, and you can read this on the right-hand scale, um, it shows the real interest rate on UK government index-linked gilts. So there's a direct measure of the real interest rate. The advantage of using UK index-linked gilts is that's been a very liquid market for about 30 years, which is longer than in the other big industrialized countries. And those measures in the UK trap track the US ones, I don't show that here, very, very closely uh, since the early 2000s when the US tips market became very liquid. And what it shows is that prior to 97, this is the red line, the global real interest rate, the real interest rate on safe assets represented by AAA rated government debt, the UK was AAA rated of course, um, was 4%. And between 96 and 99, that rate of interest halved. That's an incredibly dramatic fall in the global real interest rate. And it remained at about 2% until the crisis and then fell to zero, which is where it's been ever since. So we've been living in a zero real interest rate world since the crisis. 
What happened between 96 and 99? In essence, the Asian financial crisis. And my macro thesis, to simplify, is that the Asian financial crisis led to a pronounced shift in the balance of investment and saving worldwide, because the Asian economies, and that includes China having seen what happened to the Asian economies, decided after the financial crisis that being large-scale net importers of capital, as many of them had been before the crisis, was far too dangerous. And therefore, they moved into being surplus. And being in surplus uh, meant that they started exporting capital. They became huge exporters of capital to the developed world. And since the developed world had no real use for this money, that drove down real interest rates dramatically. And when the real interest rates fell, and that's the second part of what is shown in these charts, the, um, uh, some very important long-lived asset prices started to rise. And the green, blue, and uh, purpley lines are the, uh, sorry, the green, purple, and blue lines are real house prices in the US, Spain, and UK, which were the three most important bubble-affected housing markets. Um, and you can see that when real interest rates fell, they started to rise. And that's exactly what you would expect to happen for such long-lived assets. And that triggered an enormous rise in real property prices. Property is always the principal collateral against which the banking sector lends. So when real property prices rise, banks find collateral safer, they find more opportunities to lend, and they start expanding their balance sheets. And because they lend more and start expanding their balance sheets, that means that more people can borrow to buy houses and to build commercial developments, and that allows that to proceed further, making the balance sheets look even safer. And because they start looking even safer, they can lend even more. And there was, as a result, enormous credit booms, complex credit booms in the Western financial system with all these assets being globalized so, um, uh, that drove the crisis, in my view. That was, and it overshot, as Minsky would warn, as these things always overshoot, and the house price is overshot, and as you can see, when the crisis hit, they all collapsed, and there were tremendous losses. So it essentially it was a credit bubble triggered by a macroeconomic shift, but facilitated by the liberalization of the financial system, which in many different ways allowed an enormous credit expansion. The next chart describes very briefly the global macro side of this analysis, which basically shows what happened to the global net flow of capital across borders between 1996, just before the Asian crisis, and 2006, which was the peak of the pre-crisis boom. And in essence, I won't go into the detail of it, the, uh, this is the global balance of payments, if you like, the, the, the net capital flows. Um, the, um, the green block is Germany and Japan. The bl light blue block is the oil exporters. The yellow block is emerging Asia. So they became the surplus regions, and there were two major deficit regions. The blue one, dark blue, is the US. The purple is peripheral Europe, southern Europe, and western Europe, UK, Ireland. And essentially, the housing booms in peripheral Europe in the US absorbed the capital flows, the huge increases in the current account surpluses, which are by definition capital flows, from the surplus regions I've described. And relative to global GDP, these net flows increased about six times, six or seven times, between 1996 and 2006. So that's the, the global macro story that I tell. The, um, a crucial element in that story was the role of foreign currency accumulation. And I argue that that was uh, the consequence of the decision of, as I said, many of these countries, 
to avoid allowing um, their exchange rates to become overvalued and to avoid current accounts deficits. So instead, when capital came in or they started running large current account surpluses, they simply recycled the money that was coming in via official reserves back into the Western world, uh, principally into the US, so it's principally targeted the US, and the result of that was this enormous accumulation of foreign currency reserves. And you can see, and this goes up to the period just before the crisis, that the um, foreign currency reserves increased about, uh, from about 1.6 trillion to about 12 trillion um, by 2015. Much of that in China, but not only in China is the blue block, but also in other emerging and developing countries, overwhelmingly uh, um, uh, um, with, with Asia is the biggest chunk, but also oil exporters, and obviously Russia was one of them. Um, so they, the balance of payments globally didn't adjust in the normal way through currency adjustment. It was basically funded through very large foreign currency interventions. Meanwhile, at the domestic side, as I already indicated, there was a gigantic credit boom. This is for the US, obviously the most important country, um, and it shows the accumulation of private sector debt in the US. And if you look at the position over the 10 years leading up to the crisis, you can see a clear uh, uh, movement upwards in uh, the growth of debt in two sectors. The green uh, one, which is the financial sector itself, and that indicates the rise of very complicated transactions, securitization, and so forth within the financial sector. And the red line, the red block, shows the growth of household debt relative to GDP. And this was an enormous credit boom by United States standards, very strongly associated, as I said, with the housing finance ultimately. This peaked at the crisis and then started to fall. Uh, and that was a key part of the post-crisis deleveraging. This then left this collapse of the uh, credit bubbles that were the result of excessive responses to the declining real interest rates then led to a chronic collapse in demand. Um, uh, investment demand weakened dramatically for a whole host of reasons, including the consequence of the shock and the damage to the financial sector. Uh, the rest of the world was not in a position to pick up the slack to any large extent, though China did quite a bit. And the result was this move, which was incredibly quick, which you can see here, into ultra-low interest rates, which we've been living with ever since the crisis. And indeed, one of the most extraordinary features of this post-crisis environment is that about 30% of the world economy now is managed by central banks, which have negative interest rates, negative nominal interest rate, something that has simply never happened before. And it's an indication of the profound damage the financial crisis uh, caused. Another indication of the incredibly weak demand has been the subsequent development of long-term interest rates, both very low inflation and very weak demand for credit. These are uh, yields on 30-year bonds. So very long-term government bonds. Uh, it shows the green is the US, the red is the UK, the brown is Germany, and the blue is Japan. And you can see that prior to Mr. Trump's election, these interest rates had reached unbelievably low levels, close to zero for Japan and Germany, 1% in the UK, 2% in the US. So, so uh, to take the UK case, it's just an extraordinary figure, the UK government could borrow for 30 years at 1%. I mean, that's just an unbelievable figure, and it indicates a total collapse in credit demand in our economies. That has now picked up because of the expectation of a very large fiscal boost in the US, um, if you like, a very delayed Keynesian uh, response. The 
response to the crisis led to very large divergence in economic performance, and I discuss this in my book and why it happened, particularly between the US and Europe. So the brown line shows US GDP and the red line shows real demand in the US. The green line shows Eurozone GDP and the blue line shows Eurozone real demand. And you can see that after a very deep crisis, which is similar everywhere, deep recession, um, the US has had a reasonably steady recovery, weak by historical standards of about 2% a year, while the Eurozone had two crises, the first one and then a second Eurozone crisis in the years between 2010 and 2012, and a very weak recovery since then. And real demand in the Eurozone as a whole is still, in the third quarter of last year, below what it was before the crisis began. That's a very, very long period. And real GDP is better because the external balance of the Eurozone has moved massively into surplus as the Eurozone as a whole begins to look a bit more like Germany with weak domestic demand and very strong export performance. This divergence has also shown itself very powerfully in divergent inflation performance. So this is core consumer price inflation. Um, in the US and Eurozone, and you will see over the last few years core consumer price inflation, which excludes variable amounts, variable factors, particularly energy, has been close to 2% in the US and only 1% or so in the Eurozone. And this shows why the Fed is now beginning to tighten and the ECB is still pursuing an incredibly expansionary monetary policy. And this divergence is very, very important, explaining what's going on right now in the world economy. And finally, I think this is final on the divergence theme, and then I'll come to some of the lessons. I'm overrun a bit. Um, this shows what's happened to GDP per head since the crisis in the largest developed economies, uh, Western economies, the ones I focus on. So the brown line at the top is Germany. Germany, these are the big economies, has done far and away the best with real GDP in 2016, um, uh, 11 percent, real GDP per head, 11 percent above the 2007 level. So that's a remarkably su successful performance by Germany, and it's why the Germans are reasonably content with their economic situation. Then below them, very close together, you have the US, Japan, and UK. That's the green, red, and blue line. And they're all about 4% roughly above the pre-crisis level. Very weak recoveries, but GDP per head is above the pre-crisis level. France is brown, and it's completely stagnant. A GDP per head has not changed in the last five years. And finally, at the bottom, you've got yellow, which is Spain, which had a gigantic recession, just like Italy, which is light blue, and is now recovering strongly. And finally, as I said, there's Italy. Between 2007 and 2016, GDP per head in Germany has risen by more than 20% relative to Italy in just eight years. And that explains why the politics in the Eurozone are now so difficult. What explains this very poor performance? I think there are probably four explanations for the generally poor performance. One, pre-crisis credit trends were unsustainable, and pre-crisis GDP trends were therefore unsustainable. Second, the crisis bequeathed a huge debt overhang. Third, the crisis damaged the credit system, and particularly confidence in the credit system. And finally, policymakers adopted bad post-crisis policies, and that was especially true in the Eurozone, with far too little fiscal support at crucial moments in 2010, 11, and 12, allowing this huge second crisis to occur. Okay, let me now talk very briefly about what I think the lessons of this crisis are. Um, uh, and I think there are, and the post-crisis. The first lesson, which I believed at the time, 
is that though we didn't do a terrible job, we should have taken more aggressive action sooner to reduce the severity of the recession and particularly the accelerate the post-recession recovery. And the best instrument to use when interest rates are already at zero is fiscal policy. We relied too much on monetary policy and too little on fiscal policy at crucial moments, particularly after 2010, when the developed countries, in my view, moved prematurely to tighten fiscal policy. It is one of the great ironies of what is going on right now that while the US should clearly have had a more expansionary fiscal policy than it did in 2012, 13, and 14, it is now contemplating a much more expansionary fiscal policy when the country, country is finally back at full employment. That's almost perfectly mistimed fiscal policy. I'm just staggeringly mistimed and dangerous. So that's the first thing. Demand has to be sustained. If demand is not sustained, investment weakens, confidence weakens, and you end up in a semi-permanent slump. And that, I think, is what has happened in important parts of the Eurozone. The second th lesson, I think, is that one needs to be more decisive after a crisis than we were. And again, that was particularly true in the Eurozone in recapitalizing banks and writing down debt. The Eurozone, even today, has a burden of excessive debt in the banking sector and a loss of confidence in the banking sector, which is crippling recovery. It's improving, but it's eight years after the crisis. It's far too slow. There needs to be much more debt restructuring more radically and quickly than happened. And thirdly, there's a perfectly good argument for structural reforms which encourage growth um, uh, more rapidly. The German view on this is correct. Uh, uh, growth promoting financial sector reform, tax reforms to promote growth are all very necessary, particularly if the previous engine of growth, this credit boom in the housing sector, has run out. And I would say that if you give the look at the developed countries' policy response on these three dimensions, you couldn't give them anything better than a B. And if they could have been more aggressive, we wouldn't have had this uh, terrible problem. Now, the final two things I want to discuss, which I discuss at length, is the financial sector and global rebalancing. What we've done with our financial sector since the crisis is an immense amount of very, very complicated regulation, unbelievably complicated regulation, which I discuss, and some modest increases, but really quite modest, in capital requirements for banks, the basic cushion of banks. I think this was the wrong way round, and the right thing to have done was to have more capital and less regulation. Uh, this is a point that actually quite a number of the free market economists in America agree upon. Um, because banks are so highly leveraged, even now they're leveraged in truth about 25 to 1, they have so much debt, they're very, very vulnerable to crises. And that is why they're so heavily regulated. Um, and it's why also people still think the government backstops the banks. I think this is a very undesirable situation. We've essentially got a private sector banking sector, which we don't have confidence in. And because we don't have confidence in, and because we're so worried about future losses and crises, we just regulate them to a degree which they can't really make credit decisions on their own at all. This is the worst of all worlds. So I think the sensible thing to have done would be to have much more capital and much more uh, and less regulation. There is an alternative proposal that I discuss length of getting there, which is to make bank deposits much safer by having them backed by safe assets, thus allowing the emergence of a more market-oriented financial sector in the rest of the economy. And the final issue that I raise in my book is what I call global rebalancing. And this brings us back to the starting point. 
if you've got a world in which the developed countries are aging, they have relatively poor investment opportunities at home, which they do, the natural thing for the developed world to do is to export capital, which means to run current account surpluses. It's the same thing. But if the Western world is going to run current account surpluses, then by definition, emerging economies in general have to run current account deficits. And they can only do this if that is safer than they've experienced it in the past. And the way to do that, I argue, is to greatly increase the global insurance system against shocks for emerging and developing countries. The logical institution to do, to do that is the International Monetary Fund, but it would require not only changes in policy, but a very large increase in their assets, in their in fund assets. In the absence of that, countries will continue to accumulate reserves, and they will continue to pursue very cautious policy on net capital inflows, and that makes global rebalancing uh, very, very difficult. So the conclusion of my book, this is a major disaster. Uh, it was caused by uh, the interaction between macroeconomic forces and financial fragility. Uh, we need to make the global macroeconomy better balanced. It's very difficult to do and finance less fragile. And I should perhaps add now, at my very last remark, and I apologize for going over 10 minutes or so, 10 50 minutes. And perhaps I should add that it is obvious that the, the damage to confidence done by this crisis and the anger at the way the banks were bailed out uh, in particular has shown itself at least as one of the reasons for the votes we've seen in the last year, Brexit, the election of Donald Trump. So it has still a long way to go. Huge financial crises like this have devastating long-term consequences. So I'm very happy to take any questions now. I apologize for having gone through this at length, but I think I've given you an overview of what this book is about. Uh, Wait a Finland. Wait. I, I can speak in English. Oh, great, also, great, so great. Don't need that. Martin, uh, I have actually two or three questions. Perhaps I take the two one. Uh, first one is related to financial system and, and stability of the financial system. You mentioned that you, you could also make these uh, asset savings which are the banks more safe. Uh, what is your comments on, on uh, Mervyn King's? Proposal of, of pawn broker of, of the last resort. Well, I don't remember how it was. Pawn broker of last resort. Yes. Uh, that's the first thing. And, and could you elaborate it also? Because I don't think that people know it so well. But, but I, it would be very interesting to hear your, your opinion. Uh, perhaps it would be the other option uh, also to increasing the equity, or you can do them both at the same time. Second thing, uh, we were not now discussing about euro, and I don't know if you want to go to the euro discussion. Uh, but I would like to, you to do that. Anyway, I have on, one specific question on, on that issue. And that is, uh, please could you comment the idea of, of Euro 1, Euro 2, Euro South, Euro North. Not from the viewpoint of real, if it is realistic or doable or what this is politically or whatever, but just as an intellectual, as an economist. Okay. I would tr I'm very bad at keeping answers on these things to to to, to space, and they are two very big questions. So, um, Mervyn King, who was the governor of the Bank of England and one of the most thoughtful economists to run central banks, there's no doubt a very distinguished economist, wrote a book uh, which I think was called something about the end of alchemy or something like that. Uh, which I reviewed, actually, for, though I've written a column on it, and you should be able to get hold of it on the website of the FT, um, at least in principle. My, this is his idea, um, uh, and I will put it in its context. Um, banks know that in a crisis, uh, governments won't allow them to fail. They might let one bank fail, if it's all on its own, it's got what is called idiosyncratic risk. 
risk for this bank alone. But if the whole system is in trouble, governments always rescue them. I mean, it's an iron law. Okay? And one of the ways they rescue them is, uh, and there are many other ways, is that the central bank provides liquidity, central bank money, which is the ultimate money in our monetary systems. Uh, we're, after all, we're not on the gold standard anymore, so money is created by the government freely and really on pretty subsidized terms, much more cheaply than the banks can then borrow because they're in crisis, so they can't borrow. And this is an implicit subsidy. It's an massive, you know, it's a massive piece of insurance for the banking sector. And so they take more risk than they should. That's essentially the argument. Uh, there's a standard argument out there in the literature, which goes back to the 1930s. It's called the Chicago Plan, which suggests that the way to deal with that problem, you can eliminate it by saying that if you've got a bank you have liquid liabilities, deposits, your depo the money you have in a bank you can take out whenever you want. They're liquid from the point of view of the bank. They have to meet them on demand. You must have comparably liquid assets. But of course, if you impose that rule on banks, that means that at least against deposits, you can't lend for any business activities. You can only lend essentially to government. So Mervyn has put forward the very interesting idea that that we can get at this problem a different way. Before a crisis, the banks must indicate to the um, central bank what assets they have that they would place as collateral against lending by the central bank in a crisis. What are the assets? And the central bank would value those assets. It would say what those val assets would be worth in a crisis, they could change that from time to time, what those assets will be worth in a crisis as collateral against lending. So the banks would know what their liquid, uh, liquidity from the central bank could be. And that <coughs> would be the ceiling for their liquid liabilities. So their liquid liabilities could not exceed the amount that the central bank has stated in advance, so it's known in advance, it would provide against the collateral of those assets. And the argument for that is it would remove the moral hazard, the, the risk of excessive risk, because you would know in theory exactly how much you would get, and that would limit your liquid liabilities. I think this is a very, very clever and interesting idea, and it's a very nice compromise between the Chicago plan and where we are now. Um, and I was rather in favor of the Chicago plan, so I like this idea. There's no sign at the moment this is going to happen, uh, but it would actually make a lot of sense. And ultimately, it would reduce the ability to get runs on banks. So I think this is a very interesting idea we should look at. Second question, uh, Euro North and Euro South. I think, okay, I have felt uh, ever since this discussion began, and I've been quite consistent on this, that the Euro was a very, very bad idea. And I think so for a fairly simple reason. Uh, two fairly simple reasons. One. A fiat currency, a currency made by the state, that's what a fiat currency is, is the natural complement of government authority. It is, a, it, it is valid it, to the people because the government says it's valid. It's government power that ultimately <coughs> makes a money valid. The problem with the Eurozone is it doesn't have a government. It has many governments a whole host of governments. So the credibility of the fiat currency depends on the credibility of the whole block of governments sticking together, right, remaining together and pursuing more or less compatible policies. That's what it depends upon. That would require a very high level of fiscal u of political union, obviously. It requires a pretty high level of political union to be credible. But when the euro was created, it was obvious to me back in the early 90s, 
that the reason the euro was created was as a path to political union because they couldn't get to political union. It was a way round the problem. And the result of that was that they created the monetary union in the absence of the conditions for a political union. And that's become completely obvious in the crisis because what has happened in the crisis is that the political glue has been torn apart. And that's exactly what I argued, what I still think is the best column I've ever written on this in 1991, in which I argued that the euro was a path to destruction. A very typically English sort of point of view, but actually I think completely correct. The British aren't always wrong. Uh, so that was right. So, and the second reason that the euro is very problematic is inevitably, over time, economic events change. The competitiveness of economies changes. The, the uh, uh, developments of economies diverge. That doesn't matter if there's a very strong sense of integration within the economy, political commitment to one another, and or the various economies in the currency union are very similar. You know, it was plausible that whatever happened to Germany would probably show up in the Netherlands in a rather similar way, because they're very similar economies. But the, the economies in the Eurozone today are massively different. I mean, just hugely different. And without the national glue. The, by the way, the same is true in the US. The, the economies of the states of the US are incredibly different. There is no connection in terms of competitiveness, none, between Massachusetts and California on the one hand uh, and Arkansas and Alabama on the other. But that doesn't matter because nobody questions the political integration of the United States. That question was resolved in the Civil War. But in the Europe, it is questioned. So this is a fundamentally unviable project. And I think that in the long run, I don't know how this will happen, it will end. And I think it's a very depressing, but that's what I think. Now, one way it might end is to have two currencies. Now, you could go, I have two objections to the idea of having two currencies. The two currencies, particularly the southern one, would still be multinational currencies. And I think some of the problems, at least some of the problems I've suggested, will already, would still continue to exist if they're multinational currencies. And while coordinating the northern one around Germany is possible, it's not at all clear to me w how you coordinate the southern one. That's problem one. Problem two, which I should mention in that, is where does France fit in? Uh, but that's not a bit small one. That's not a small issue. The reason it became the big euro is because France wanted the other countries in. Germany didn't want them in. Germany didn't want the euro. They were quite sensible uh, uh, about it. And the third problem, but I don't think we're getting, and you mentioned this, is I can't see of any way of getting from here to there which doesn't actually mean that it breaks up on national grounds, on national lines. Uh, uh, so while... It might have been sensible to start off with a northern and southern currency, though that would have defeated the whole point of the exercise from the French and Italian point of view, because they wanted to get German credibility on the cheap. It would uh, be impossible to go from where you are now to anything like that. Now, you asked me not to talk about the practicalities. Uh, so I tend to think... It's either national currencies within an ERM-type structure, adjustable exchange rates, which is crisis from time to time, uh, uh, or you stick with what you have. And neither of these are satisfactory outcomes. I recognize all alternatives are terrible. Sorry, that's a, two big questions, and I couldn't deal with them more quickly. Uh, who else? Uh, 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 hi, Martin. Uh, I'm Andrei Simonov, Michigan State. And I have a very simple question. Uh, you never talk about one of the main obstacles to coming back, and that's actually a restoration of core market principles, that the prices should be dictated by the market and stuff like that. I see a lot of deviations from this principle in the last eight years, to the lesser extent in the US, to the to more extent in Europe. How can we come back without restoring to those core principles, if ever? 
I presume you are talking about central bank policy primarily. So you're taking the Austrian line that what we should have had is a proper deep crash. Uh, yeah, so the central bank monetary policy was inappropriate. The, the um, well, I suppose this leads to a pretty fundamental disagreement, which is, our, so in other words, our current real interest rates a reflection of the real existing situation of our economies or a massive distortion from what they should be. So I'm going to be incredibly crude, and you will forgive me for this. I have argued many times that we are operating in a very peculiar economy in worldwide in which the real interest rate on safe assets in equilibrium is close to zero. And the reason it's close to zero, which I think is consistent with all the other asset prices, is we actually are operating in a world, for a whole host of reasons, where the demand for real physical capital by business is very small. There's not much need for it. And uh, uh, profit shares are high, partly because of globalization. And forced savings in emerging worlds are incredibly high, as I've already indicated. The countries that have the largest opportunities are all saving surplus, which is very different from the historical situation. So as a result, we have lots and lots of savings in the world, people saving, um, which, for which, which match uh, uh, the demand for investment at real interest rates which are unbelievably low. And I believe that's a real phenomenon, not some distortion of monetary policy. I don't believe central banks are setting long-term real interest rates. I think our economies are setting long-term in real interest rates. And this will end when either people stop saving so much and or um, there's a big investment boom somewhere in the world. I don't think there's anything in our policies that are preventing, apart from the regulatory policies, are preventing that huge investment boom. I think it's underlying structural forces in the world economy. I recognize this is a profound disagreement. And the truth is, we can't know the answer without trying the alternative. And right at the moment, the chances of trying the alternative I think very, very small. And in the new Trump world, my own guess is we're going to have more mad monetary uh, actions because what I think is going to happen is we are now moving into a massive fiscal expansion at the wrong time. The central bank will start tightening monetary policy in Fed and the Trump will try to prevent them from doing so. Uh, so I think your problem will get worse. The distortions will get worse. But fundamental question is, at the world level, is this a distorted set of prices or not? I'm one of those people who think these prices are not distorted. They are actually equilibrium prices. They're just very weird. And uh, I understand very well there are lots of people who I think that monetary policy has essentially created these problems. And if monetary policy simply stop doing what it did. We would move to a new equilibrium with completely different real asset prices. Obviously, there would be a huge amount of debt destruction in the process, but then we would we will be on our way up. Um, I think we just have to accept there's a fundamental disagreement on this. Can I, this gentleman take one question from this gentleman? Last one. Three minutes. We are, we are running out of time. I'm, I overran. Uh, okay, uh, very interesting book. I, I bought the book, by the way. I've got it in my Kindle. Okay, I haven't read it yet. But uh, my question is, you mentioned securitization. And when you look at securitization, uh, the repeal of Glass-Steagall, and uh, CDSs, credit, credit default swaps, uh, these other financial instruments that were used during the crisis, how would you weight those in terms of uh, as a cause of the financial crisis in 2000, call it 2007 to 2000? It's still going on, actually. 
but but how would you weight those uh, uh, particular uh, actions as a cause of the financial okay. crisis? Well, this is then the in in interaction of macro and micro, macro and finance. So my view of this is something like this. The macro trends prior to the crisis were unsustainable. That is to say, in the, in the simple sense, there was a massive and progressive accumulation of debt uh, associated with um, uh, the macro conditions before the crisis and, uh, and associated monetary policy. And I take the view Again, this comes back to our discussion earlier that the macro, the monetary policy was endogenous. It was determined by these these set of policies, including particularly uh, uh, reserve accumulation and other policies in the rest of the world. Um, uh, but the financial system uh, um, developments that you describe were an important exacerbating factor in. Uh, two fundamental respects. One, because they hid the risks, concealed the risks, they allowed far more risks than will be t to be taken within that envelope of debt that was being accumulated. So, the, so there was a lot of very bad lending even within that debt accumulation and that turned out to be particularly true in the US and in a few other countries but particularly true in the US. And I think that's quite interesting. Um, so, to give you one interesting indication of that bad lending, um, we had a big mortgage boom in the UK and there was a big mortgage boom in the US, roughly similar in scale actually, but the US, U US banks and financial institutions had gigantic losses on their lending and the British banks didn't. And the main reason is the British banks had them on their balance sheet. So they knew what they were, and the American banking banks didn't. So the quality of lending, given the boom, was much worse. And in addition to that, the distribution of the bad assets in the system was un completely non-transparent. So when the panic hit, when the panic hit, nobody knew the true state of, state of any of their counterparties which again would not have been true with traditional lending. If there had been traditional mortgage lending to subprime borrowers, you'd have known where it was concentrated because you knew where the areas were that were in trouble. You know, Florida real estate, you knew who would lend to Florida real estate and you knew not to lend to those banks and they would collapse. But in this case, because of the structure of the new financial system, this lending, these bad assets were spread throughout the entire world and it created a pervasive tainting. So my view is that the, the new securitized financial sector was in those two dimensions a very important exacerbating factor and it made the panic in 2008 devastating devastating. But it should be noted that countries that didn't have that sort of lending structure, like Spain and Ireland, um, also had pretty big credit problems because credit associated with housing grew too much. It just was more manageable. So that would be my brief answer. I've got to stop now, otherwise something terrible will happen. Thank you very, very much for listening. Thanks.